The Law Society briefing for this debate, very good, points out the cuts in scope and eligibility for civil legal aid mean that many fewer people will be able to bring cases to court. goes on to point out that uh, solicitors will either find other areas of work or cherry-pick cases. And very briefly, I'll just say this. We have many brilliant law students in this country. We have many brilliant young people wanting to go into law and do their very best. They end up, whether they want to or not, often doing property and commercial law because that's where the money can be made, that's where they can get work, that's where they can get jobs. They don't do legal aid because there isn't enough money around to do it. There aren't enough companies doing legal aid work. And so we have amazing levels of representation for well-off people dealing with commercial cases or corporate cases. We don't have the same uh, availability for those dealing with um, uh, criminal cases or housing or immigration or family cases. Now, there's a lot I could say in this debate, but I, uh, I took your hint earlier that you didn't want me to go on too, you didn't want me to go on too long. It was very subtly put, if I may say so. Um, but uh, the two quick points I want to make on family, on family law cases is utterly absurd to separate the idea that you would get legal aid if violence is involved if violence is not involved, you won't. Well, we have watched, I'm sure of us, all of us, families implode in lots of pressures and lots of things. The degeneration of a relationship into a battle, into a court case and so on, can get very, very nasty. Mediation doesn't always work. We all want mediation to work, of course we do, but it doesn't always work. That can then degenerate into violence. If you've got sensible, effective, legal advice at a much earlier stage, you can actually prevent a lot of this degeneration into something far worse. And the last point I'd make is on immigration cases. I'm pleased that the um, uh, Green Paper specifically excludes any cut in representation for asylum cases. I welcome that and I um, uh, you know, pay tribute to the Minister for that because I think it's very important that those that are faced with deportation or asylum cases, possibly with death or torture on their return to where they've come from, do deserve legal aid and I would absolutely defend that and I'm sure everybody in this chamber, or at least I hope they all would. But however, on immigration cases where they're often very complicated, legal aid is limited to those in detention but not to the case itself. So a family is put in detention, quite wrongly if there's children involved in my view, um, and they can get legal aid to try and get out of detention, but they can't get legal aid for the burden of the case. That seems to me a complete non sequitur. We either support immigration cases or we don't. And I would hope that the Minister would recognise that the injustices surrounding this, particularly uh, Article 6 and Article 8 applications under the Human Rights Convention, are very, very important and do deserve legal aid. And the late um, Judge Henry Hodge made the point that uh, as chief uh, as judge of the uh, Immigration Appeals Tribunal, he constantly made references to the Legal Services Commission wanting sufficient resources to make representations available. Watching a case in an, uh, appeal ca an immigration appeal court where there is no representation for the applicant, but there is representation for the Home Office, is unbelievably and blatantly and obviously unfair. It's just simply not a credible way of doing things. So I do urge the Minister to think again very seriously on these particular aspects and remember the principle of access to justice for all. That will not be possible if these cuts go through. Robert Buckley. I'm very grateful, <laughs> Mrs Reid, and I'm very grateful to the Honourable gentle, Gentleman, the Member for Islington North, for uh, truncating his remarks. I will follow his example and be as brief as I can. Uh, I should declare an interest. I was a criminal legal aid barrister for nearly 20 years, and I'm still in receipt of some payments for work done prior to the election. But really, my remarks today are centred around um, what other members have talked about when it comes to the reduction in the ambit of uh, civil legal aid, the um, community legal service funding, for work that is done by a number of providers, including law centres in my constituency of Swindon, the Wiltshire Law Centre, providing excellent work and, and, and advice for uh, people with debt problems, housing problems and welfare benefits problems. I'm not going to repeat the points made by uh, other members. They are absolutely right when it comes to the important saving that can be made uh, by early advice and help for people on welfare benefits. My uh, remarks are really drawn to the detail of the helpful tables set out 
uh, towards the back end of the Green Paper. May I just preface my remarks about this Green Paper by saying this. I really do hope, uh, Mrs. Reardon, that this will be the last such consultation for a considerable period of time. The Lord Chancellor was quite right to uh, note with some despair the fact that there have been over 30 consultations relating to legal aid since 2006. Uh, it led practitioners, me included, to frankly have our heads in a spin uh, when it almost seemed month by month uh, the last government or the Legal Services Commission to be more precise because, of course, it was an arm's length um, body. Now, to come back into the Ministry of Justice, issued consultations about legal aid. We do not want a state of permanent revolution. Uh, that has caused a lot of problems to providers and has led to some of the uh, issues that the previous speaker raised about uncertainty of uh, sources of work. Um, coming back to it then, the uh, table that I referred to at the back of the Green Paper is helpful, but in some cases unclear. Now, this is a Green Paper, and I very much hope that the Government take on board what is said today and what will be submitted by way of written and, uh, evidence uh, to, to the Government uh, by February the 14th. Can I first of all deal with uh, family legal aid and what is called the domestic violence test? Now, there is no statutory definition or no unified definition of what is meant by domestic violence. Now, some people may say that you know it when you see it, but frankly, some questions do arise as to the ambit of what that term means. Now, does it just mean physical violence where injury is concerned? Uh, I would submit that that would be far too narrow a test. Does it just involve violence as between spouses or partners? Or does it involve violence uh, against children of the family? Or violence in the presence of children of the family? All these questions need to be answered. Now, having dealt uh, over many years with domestic violence cases, they take many forms. And I can tell you, it's not just physical violence, Mrs. Reardon. Very often, it's a course of conduct that can involve uh, a mental uh, process, a psychological damage to one or other of the partners. So I, I would like real clarity when it comes to what is meant by domestic violence by the time we get to the white paper stage. Um, then dealing very briefly with education, um, uh, I, I noted with concern uh, the uh, suggestion that all, all education cases were to be taken out of scope. Um, we mustn't ignore the fact that very soon the Department for Education will be producing its own green paper on special educational needs. And I know that it is the intention of ministers to try and look carefully and to reform the current system of tribunals and um, the adversarial system that so often is a real barrier to parents and children with special educational needs. Now, I, I think that that is welcome news, and I very much hope that the Green Paper, when it's published, will contain that commitment to radically reform the system so that parents don't feel they're always having to fight for the rights of their children when it comes to SEN. But if that isn't to be the case, then frankly, I would submit that any reduction in scope for legal representation, particularly at the upper tier tribunal level, where there is a lot of law and, and a lot of lawyers, and, and quite frankly, a very daunting prospect for any parent of a child with SEN, I would submit that that should not be taken out of scope if it is not the intention of the government <coughs> to reform the uh, system when it comes to SEN provision. Um, the position with regard to clinical negligence is um, one that is often overlooked. Um, <clears throat> I would suggest, uh, Mrs. Reardon, that there will be a number of cases of great complexity. Uh, for example, cases where a number of different causes have led to the condition of the particular litigant. Uh, a litigant who often will be very vulnerable and very ill, uh, even at the time of litigation. And that requires a great degree of work, a degree of, work, a degree of uh, medical expert evidence, which is costly. Uh, and I would submit that uh, it will be a very brave set of solicitors indeed who would take on a, on a no-win, no-fee basis uh, cases of such complexity. So I would ask that at the margins, that particular aspect of, of, of the Green Paper be looked at very carefully. And I'll end on this note. Uh, a lot has been talked about when it comes to uh, legal help and representation for debt matters where somebody's home is at immediate risk. 
I simply beg the question, what does that mean? Does it mean immediate risk when possession proceedings have been commenced? Or does it mean immediate risk uh, at an earlier stage when perhaps the householder has had a, a set of letters uh, relating to uh, unpaid debt and is therefore a great concern? There are a lot of words here that are used but frankly are not used carefully enough. Uh, and whilst I accept that this is at a green paper stage, I would ask for a lot more clarity when it comes to assessing uh, the uh, precise ambit of scope. Because I can, I can tell you, as a former member of a funding review committee for the Legal Services Commission, um, these criterion are applied very carefully indeed. And they have to be right. And it's also right for me to say this uh, in closing, that very often for a practitioner, such as those that work in the Wiltshire Law Centre, a case will present itself which will at first blush appear to be one type of uh, problem, but then will transmogrify into another type or a whole different range of problems. And therefore, questions of scope aren't just academic ones. They are very, very important for solicitors and practitioners when assessing whether or not cases will come within or without legal aid. Uh, I would therefore urge the Minister to take very much on board the comments of members today and to uh, ask his colleagues to look very carefully at the ambit of these proposals and to refine them in a way that not only helps litigators and solicitors, but most importantly, helps those in greatest need. Thank you. Emma Reynolds. Thank you, Mrs. Riordan. I'd like to congratulate my honourable friend for Westminster North for securing this very important debate. Uh, the changes and cuts proposed in the government's legal aid green paper are, are of a issue of great concern across the country as we've seen this morning but in particular in areas such as Wolverhampton where there are high levels of deprivation and this is precisely people who are deprived and vulnerable whose only recourse to justice is through the legal aid budget and in opening I'd like to make two brief points and the first is that the legal aid system was actually instigated by the post-war Labour government in a time where we were looking at the national deficit and it was an issue hot on the heels of the setting up of the NHS the legal aid system has become a pillar of the welfare state and I believe if these green paper proposals go forward, that pillar will be put at risk. And we should not forget that prior to 1949, the only people who were able to access justice in our country were those who were able to afford it. And I do not want to go back to that situation. Secondly, I wanted to put on record my tremendous respect for the professionalism and work of the Citizens Advice Bureau up and down the country, but in particular in Wolverhampton. A Wolverhampton CAB deals with 14,000 inquiries every year, um, which is quite astonishing, and 1,700 each year of those are legal aid inquiries. And it is widely recognised by others in the region um, that Wolverhampton CAB is a beacon of, of best practice. And last year they won um, the Outstanding Black Country Business of the Year Award, recognised by the um, voted by members of the Black Country Chamber of Commerce for increasing their, actually doubling their workload with the same resources. So I want to put, I, I will indeed. Grant Davis. You say to my honourable friend that as in Wolverhampton in Swansea the CAB does a marvellous job but in fact their contract for legal aid for debt and welfare was terminated on the 14th of November and since that time no one has had that contract, and there's been some signal they may get it again. But do you think it's appalling that there should be this uh, hole in, in the budget flow, that people, there should be a change of provider and the great uncertainty amongst venerable, very vulnerable groups? Does she share my concern about financial provision and, and, and continuity for the future for the CAB? 